Welcome to Bruce Hurwitz Presents Meet the Experts. I'm your host, Bruce Hurwitz of Hurwitz Strategic Staffing. You can find us on the web at hsstaffing.com. I hope you'll consider us for all your staffing, career counseling, and speech writing needs. I am delighted to be joined today by Taryn Abrams of Empower Behavioral Services. Our topic is building resilience during times of uncertainty. Meet the Experts is sponsored by P&K CPAs. P&K is a full service accounting firm. They provide accounting and consulting services to businesses ranging from startups to small and mid cap companies to nonprofits, as well as high net worth individuals. Contact them today for a free consultation at pk-cpas.com or call them at 973-882-8810. They will be happy to be of service. Taryn, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It is my pleasure. Please take a moment or two and introduce yourself to our viewers. Yes, so again, my name is Taryn Abrahams and I am the founder and CEO of Empower Behavioral Services. Uh, my company offers behavioral-based coaching, consulting, and training services focused on helping businesses to address interpersonal barriers within their employees. So with a background in clinical psychology, I work collaboratively with HR and business leaders to identify those barriers, whether it's um, issues with communication, whether it's helping the five generations in the workforce get along more efficiently or effectively, uh, or whether it's just to help them in, in uh, implement best practices to help create and strengthen their business culture. Um, that's really the work that I do. So thank you so much. I was chuckling and you said interpersonal barriers. Uh, years ago, I was, when I lived in Israel, I was the, um, I worked at a uh, children's mental health center. It was a small center that specialized in interpersonal communication problems that children have. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the nicest compliments I was paid was after working there for a year, I had, I had been responsible for all the non-clinical aspects of mm -hmm. it. And again, this was a small center. So I don't want to make a big deal out of it. But I organized a um, visit by potential fundraisers. And when I was finished making the pitch, now I, my boss was there, who was the coordinator of the program. Um, I asked if they had any questions. And they started to ask questions. And I answered all their questions. And when they were done, uh, they thanked me. They thanked the coordinator of the program. And they left. And then she looked at me and said, do you know what you did? And I said, no, what did I do? And she said, you answered all their clinical questions. And I felt terrible. I said, I'm sorry, I apologize. I didn't realize I did that. She goes, no, it's fine. You didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> Harkening back to those days when the PhD in international relations, or at the time the PA, the doctoral candidate in international relations was talking about uh, children's mental health issues. Yeah. The children were, I, were what were called the identified patients. In mm -hmm. other words, yes, they had problems, but their problems were related to their parents. Yeah. Yeah. And in order to solve their problems, we had to solve, we had to teach, not we, I didn't do it, but right. the therapist had to teach the parents what they were doing wrong. So if there yeah. are interpersonal barriers, is it the same thing for you that your clients, let's say the employees are the identified patients and the employers are the ones with the problem or vice versa? That's such a fantastic question, and it so is right up my alley in terms of where my training comes from. I was trained in systems theory, which is really what you're talking about, is, right, everybody is interconnected, 
And so when you, when you refer to the child as being the identified patient, oftentimes, yes, they are the identified patient, but they are a symptom of a bigger issue. And so I look at the workplace from a very, very, the same sort of framework. You know, oftentimes I get the phone call, you know, we're having harassment issues. Um, you know, we're, we have high turnover, you know, we're, we're bringing in great talent. We just can't seem to retain that talent. And I look at those as symptoms, right? Just as though that child might be that symptom, these issues that they're experiencing are symptoms of a bigger issue. And my job is to identify what are the bigger issues that are going on. And oftentimes it does fall on leadership, just like it falls on the parents, right? So it's developing that trusting rapport to be able to, um, you know, have those sometimes very difficult conversations, you know, that that's not always the easiest thing to do. And, and sometimes leaders don't always want to hear what, what needs to be said, right? So it, it there's some sort of um, tactfulness and, and a sort of an art around that, if you will. But that's a great question. And absolutely, I, I think that I look at companies as, as an entire system of, of interconnected pieces that all impact each other. Uh, nobody's in a silo. Uh, one more question. And viewers can probably see at the bottom uh, where your name appears, you have what I call alphabet soup. Yes. What is MFT? So MFT is a specialized mental health degree. It stands for marriage and family therapist. Okay. And so there are many different master's degree programs that are out there. There's social work. Um, there's, you know, there's all different types. There's all different models. MFT is a specific two-year program focused solely on training people on systems theory. So if you end up needing marital counseling, for instance, or individual counseling, if you go to an MFT most times they're going to want you to bring in other people. They don't usually treat just the individual uh, because we are interconnected. In order to treat the individual, you need to include the system. So whether it's a partner, whether it's even a friend, a parent, a sibling. And so that's what MFT stands for. And I'm proud, I'm proud of those letters, Bruce, because, you know, being that I play in the HR space, I, I really believe that's one of the biggest things that, that differentiates me um, from, from, you know, my colleagues in the HR space. My training is, is very different um, than somebody that ends up, you know, um, going into a program specifically for human resources. Again, um, my, my, my framework is, is unique. And I feel that's a big piece to, um, you know, the work that I do and why I feel that I'm effective in what I do is, is I, I always say this. I said this this morning on a, on a client call. I live below the surface. You know, you hire someone like me and I'm going to peel some of those layers back and, and help other people understand the why in terms of what drives behavior. If you can help people connect those dots, it's a powerful moment whether it's personal or professionally. Thank you for that. Now, I want to go to the slide that you prepared. And I hate it when people read. I'm not going to read. I'm not going to read. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm not asking you to read it. <laughs> read it on their own. I want to focus on what's highlighted. Yes. Because as everyone knows and everyone will remember when they see this, even a few months time, this was at the, um, hopefully the apex of the COVID-19. Yes. Both in the uh, literal um, center of the hotspot. Right. So these are oh, yeah. uncertainty. And you're saying that information strategy are best allies by which you mean the best way to overcome uncertainty. Right. Okay. Right. So, so what we need to remember is that, and we can thank our, ans our uh, prehistoric ancestors for this, right? So when we enter into a crisis situation, we enter typically into a fight or flight mode. And what ends up happening is because we 
um, are under such stress, we sometimes tend to have tunnel vision. We, we tend to become sometimes very obsessed or we have a tendency to um, obsess over, over things that we can't control and we lose sight over the things that we do have control. And so our mind typically gets very stuck. And what ends up happening is, is when we become stuck mentally, it creates a chain reaction, right? I feel hopeless. Then that can lead to uh, feelings of depression. That could lead to poor self-care. That can lead to lack of motivation to want to stay engaged with my business and my company and my employees. Um, so it can, it can have sort of a ripple effect. And so I created this program, obviously, in reaction to COVID-19 and the current pandemic. Quite honestly, I, I, you know, I was waking up when this whole thing started. The thing that woke me up at night was this burning desire of how can I help people? What can I? Sorry. Uh, I just want to go back to this slide because you said you created this program, and I wanted people to realize that you're talking about your virtual resilience resilience wellness, wellness program. Sure. Yes. Yes. And this was created from a desire to really leverage my intellectual property as a clinician, as well as I, I'm. And I just want to let the audience know I'm no longer in the clinical space. I have moved my practice into the business environment. And so now I'm a corporate behavioral specialist. And so what I've done is it, it's to sort of solve this burning desire to help people and, and alleviate some of that helpless feeling. I think we're all feeling right now being in our homes. I wanted to create a program that would help business leaders and HR professionals, um, you know, help improve and strengthen the core soft skills required to increase personal resiliency. And let's, let's, let me just let the audience know, resiliency is basically our ability to adapt and bounce back, right? And so eventually this will pass. I do believe that in my heart, right? Whether it's a new normal or the old normal, we're going to get back. The question becomes, how can we keep our mental and emotional well-being intact? to keep people engaged, invested in their work, so that they can get back and be whole as, as an individual and as a worker. And so I've created a program designed to help people build, uh, res build that resiliency, build those skills that are required to get through tough times, such as building optimism, um, increasing emotional intelligence, uh, improving your, your problem solving skills. Now, many of us maybe are under normal, non-stressful circumstances, we may be very good problem solvers. But remember, again, when we're under crisis, we tend to get sort of fixated on certain details that prevent us from becoming innovative, from preventing us from solving problems. Um, so, you know, my program is really to kind of help sort of um, develop and improve those necessary soft skills so that people can protect their emotional well-being. But there are two phases. There's the current phase where you right. have to relax. You have to stay in control. Mm -hmm. And for that, you need information and strategy, which is probably why the president's daily uh, briefings and the governor's daily briefings yep. are so popular because you're getting information from leadership mm -hmm. and you know what their strategy is and that can help you to build the strategy but there can be too much and you can be overwhelmed by it right right Absolutely. So there's that fine balance between being a transparent leader, right? Sharing the information that's important and relevant, but also being mindful that it's, you know, you're doing it in a way that's being received well. Um, I think, honestly, I, I really believe that it's, it's a really wonderful opportunity right now for leaders to step up and, and show their commitment to their employees. And what better way to do that than to, um, in, you know, than to implement services that are not so much focused so much on work, although all of this will help provide better quality work, but really giving them a gift to help them, um, you know, 
focus on the things that honestly are should be a priority right now, which is mental health. I mean, before COVID-19, one in five people, one in five employees suffered with, with depression or anxiety. That was before the pandemic. Um, and some of the articles that I'm seeing, I mean, we're still trying to sort out, out all these numbers and, and, and figure out what those numbers look like now, but it's safe to say that that number is probably going to double. Um, you know, people that maybe never even experienced depression, anxiety may find themselves in some very dark places right now. Um, people are going through a tremendous amount of hardship, whether you're experiencing loss, whether loss of a job, loss of a loved one, lack of control, lack of maybe that, you know, sense of like, I don't have that freedom right now. Um, so, you know, it's uh, to me, it, 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 if you want to find a creative way to protect your bottom line and, and to protect your business, a, what a wonderful way to give people a gift to help them protect their mental health. Because uh, to me, I feel like it's it's really all interconnected, right? Then you go back to that systems theory again. It really is all interconnected. If 25% of employees pre-COVID-19 mm -hmm. could almost say antebellum America uh, right? had uh, mental health problems. And let's assume for the most part, that employers didn't know about it, which is right. an assumption to make. Right. It also means that 75% did not have any mental health problems. <clears throat> if we focus, if the boss comes on and now is acting as a counselor, as a therapist, or hires someone and says, I want everyone to have a, um, I don't know, 15 minute, half hour Zoom conversation yeah. with Karen to go over yeah. what, uh, any problems you may be having. It would all be confidential. I'm not going to get any reports on it just to make you feel better. And if there's something that I need to know, she will tell you that she thinks that you should talk to me and you'll talk to me. That way there you have nothing to fear from the perspective of confidentiality. Yeah. It's all fine and good, but what if the person doesn't want to hear about mental health problems? They want to focus on work. Their best solution is work. They don't mm. want to know about the mental health issues that they could be facing. Uh, I'll give you an example. Yeah. I literally have just finished reading um, Ron Chernow's biography of, uh, I don't know what to call him, President General Grant. And he wrote his autobiography, which I have read and I highly recommend, but that's another subject. Uh, when he was dying of cancer, he had huh. cancer of the mind. He couldn't speak, he couldn't swallow, he couldn't eat. He was in bad shape. He died, if I remember correctly, two days after finishing the book. Oh, wow. And what kept him going was writing that book. Work is what saved him. He knew he was dying, he knew he had cancer, he knew all, what all his problems were. Work can sometimes be the best medicine. So if we all need we all need a schedule, we all need a routine. So if yeah, you're still gonna be working from nine to five, you're gonna be working from home from nine to five, and I expect you to get done everything that you got done, that may be the best medicine. Question, not a statement. Yeah, no, absolutely. Listen, everybody deals with things differently. Um, I remember the day after this whole thing happened, I spoke to one of my female colleagues and, you know, she was like, oh, I've, I've already planned out my schedule for the week. I mean, she was like rocking and rolling. She it was like nothing was going to shake her and she was just going to full steam ahead. She was going to just continue what she was doing with work. Um, and then I have other people that can't seem to figure out a way to create that daily schedule, can't seem to figure out a way to get back on track. So 
You know, I think what you're saying is, is very valid. I, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, work can be a wonderful way to kind of um, not, you know, manage what's going on outside of our homes and, and keep us sane. Um, but for, for some of us, we're, some of us don't always find so much comfort um, in, in work, although they do find comfort at work. They just can't seem to figure out how to get there. Um, I speak to some people um, that really want to dive back into work. They still thankfully have a job, but they can't seem to focus. They open the computer, they get sidetracked. Um, and, and so what I provide is, is some best practices, some proven strategies that I know work. So for instance, I did a webinar last week um, and on the webinar, we talked about the impact of keeping the news on in the background. And, you know, some of us, especially some of us who live alone, um, find comfort in having something on in the background. And a lot of people lately have been putting on the news and leaving it on. And what people don't realize is that you are still paying attention, even if it's on a subconscious level, you are still internalizing all of that information that's being delivered. And let's face it, the news isn't so positive right now. Now. So, so even making a switch in terms of being mindful of terms of what your environment, how your environment is set up can make all the difference in terms of your ability to focus. And so a couple of people commented on the call, oh my God, I didn't even think of that. Um, I'm going to totally try that tomorrow. And they emailed me and they said, I, I had a much more productive day. I didn't even realize the impact that, that news was having on my ability to focus on my work. Right. Um, another thing, too, is, you know, it, when and before when we used to sit down and, and just, you know, get through a whole eight hour day pretty easily, that might not be possible right now. You know, some of us have children. They're being homeschooled. Some of us are dealing with sickness. Some of us are taking care of loved ones. Um, even just the fiasco of having to get food can take a whole day out of your work schedule. Right. So so really kind of helping people to redefine what productive looks like, I think, is an important piece to keeping us sane right now. Maybe productive looks like two hours of quality work and food shopping. Right. Maybe that's a productive day right now. Um, and that's OK. And I think a lot of us tend to be very self-critical. Oh, I should have done more. I wish I could have done this or I had 10 things on my to do list and I only got to two. And I think we need to kind of redefine what we consider to be a productive day. And, and sometimes just that mental shift can make all the difference in how we feel throughout the day. I'd like to throw something out. Sure. We have the news in the background. And that's all fine and good. But as I said before, that can give you information overload. And all of a sudden, you know, it's all bad. Right. And, and it can right. be depressing. Very. Yeah. One of the things that I sometimes like to do, it's free. You just go to YouTube, put in TED Talk, and just let them run. Put on autoplay and one after the other in the background. And sometimes it's distracting because, hey, this guy is good. I want it's to good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back to the beginning and actually spend 18 minutes and listen to this person. Right. But it's not depressing. And you're learning something. And one of the things that I say to my career counseling clients is now is a great time to improve your knowledge. You're not yes. able to improve your soft skills which are the interpersonal, but you can improve your hard skills and learn something new. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the question, and this is where I come in, is how can we get people to sort of calm the mind a little bit, right? Alleviate some of those, those anxieties that are keeping us up at night, because I know sleep is a big problem for a lot of us. How can we sort of dial that down a little bit so that we can create some goals? Because I agree with you. This is a great opportunity to learn a new skill, um, to, to read, to, to gain some knowledge. Uh, you know, there's, there's, it's a wonderful time for that. But we, we, we also need to be able to be in the right mindset to do that. Um, and so, you know, that's where, I, that's where I come in, you know. I haven't mentioned one thing which sort of surprised me because we're to varying degrees locked in our homes. 
I mean, Frank's I get out and won't get into any trouble. I put on a mask. I don't even yeah. have to put on a mask, but I put on a mask because everybody else has a mask on. So <laughs> I let people be comfortable. Yeah. Uh, I can walk to the pharmacy. I can walk to the, um, to the soup. Well, it's not really a supermarket, but I can walk to the Dollar Tree store and get what I need. And, or I can get on the bus and go to um, the supermarket. But there are people who can't leave their home for two weeks because they have been, they've tested positive for right. the uh, disease. And even if you are able to go to the pharmacy and to go shopping to the supermarket, you're not gonna do that every day. Now you can go for a walk outside, which is fine. And in the last two weeks, there was one nice day when I could actually do that. Yeah. But I exercise. I have my stationary bike. I do my 10 miles a day. And Good for you. I do it while watching the news. <laughs> and well, it, it, cause it's boring. Yeah. And so, um, plus if the news is bad, it energizes me and I go. Oh back. yeah, that's a good workout, yeah. It, it, it can be, if the news is boring, it's a long 10 miles. But anyways, what is the, we've only got a few minutes left. What is the importance of exercising? Not just physically, but because of your background mentally, in becoming more resilient? So, I mean, there's a lot of there's science behind that. I mean, when you exercise, you release something called endorphins, right? Which is sort of like a feel good chemical in, in your body, very similar to the, um, the uh, chemicals that um, are in antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. So a very simple way to change or shift your mood is to exercise. And we must remember that the body is connected to the mind, right? So if you are somebody that maybe struggles with anxiety, uh, maybe struggling to sort, sort of see the silver lining, get on a bike, get out, get your heart rate up, you know? Um, and I'm not just talking about just an easy walk. I mean, like, get a sweat on, like, really get your heart rate elevated and for more than 20 minutes, and, and you will be shocked at how that can shift your mood. Um, it, it's, it's pretty, it's powerful. It's very powerful. Um, so exercise is really important. And, and I think it, that just plays into the whole concept of just practicing good self-care right now. It's very easy um, for people to fall into the mindset of, well, I'm just going to drink every day. Or I'm just going to eat whatever's in front of me because, oh, well, it doesn't matter. But it does matter. It all imp impacts how we feel. Um, and what we don't want is to develop more bad habits so that when this is over, now we've got to deal with weight loss issues and addiction issues. And so that's not going to that's not going to help us. Right. So as much as it's easy to just do what feels we want to do, which maybe is to stay in bed and, and to maybe eat a little bit more. In the end, it's really not the best thing for our mental health. But I do, if there's anything that I could say to, per, to resonate with people is all of us are feeling this. All of us are struggling in some ways, you know, or another. Um, and so th that's the one thing that I, I do want people to realize is that we really are all in this together. Um, and that we don't have, we can choose the way we respond to stress. We can't choose or control what's going on outside, but we can choose how we handle it and how we respond to it. And so that, that's the power that we have. And to me, that's exciting. That's exciting. That gives me a sense of control, Darren, which I think we're all looking for, right? Darren, we're running out of time, but I promised you that before we ended, and I'm going to put up the slide with your contact information, but you had mentioned that you have a complimentary uh, service that you are offering. So yes, tell our viewers about that. Yes. So I am offering a free phone consultation to any business owner, HR professional that wants to discuss creative ways to build resiliency um, and, and improve the employee wellness um, so, so that they can preserve their emotional and mental well-being. 
Um, that is my gift to you. And I hope that uh, companies will take advantage of that. And I look forward to that opportunity. And yes, please contact me. My website is www.empowerbehavioralservices.com. You can get, you can um, access information about my wellness, wellness program online. Um, you can also shoot me an email at info at empowerbehavioralservices.com. Or you can just pick up the phone, which I always love, 973-803-8276. Thank you so much, Bruce. I'm Bruce Hurwitz. Thank you for watching. And as always, please stay focused on success.